everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to UCB on a Tuesday night at 11 p.m. Very late. Very late. Thank you. Very late. Give yourselves a round of applause. Seriously, I'm so hyped that you guys came to support live comedy late on a Tuesday in pilot season. Give yourselves another round of applause. If you're new to the show by some chance, <laughs> this is the Box Angels podcast. I'm the host, Mike Boxell. They're generally what happens is I interview people about how they got started in show business and how they've you know started out and where they came from and where they're going, things like that. But on this live 300th episode... Congratulations, Mike. Congratulations. And I know everybody's listening to all 300. I appreciate all that. That's a lot of content. I'm a content creator. Content churner at this point. Ooh, that's a call back to episode 237. Oh, exactly. See, Demi listens, you guys. We're going to talk about how... we got a great panel here. We're going to talk about how they've maintained success because I can't even break into this son of a bitch, let alone figure out how to keep it going. So I figured I wanted to bring my uh, cohort here, Brandon Sornberger. Give it up for Brandon Sornberger. Brandon's going to be the guest co-host. Brandon's done the podcast a couple of times. I have, yes, yes. I've I guest hosted. I've been on. I've been on more than anyone else. Is yes, that, true? that is true. That is correct. What an honor. Demi knows that because he's a super fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done 248 of the 300 episodes. <laughs> Which I think is not enough, honestly. Get me on a little bit more, we'll, Mike. We'll get you on another 500 in the next uh, oh, two I weeks. I can't wait. I can't wait. Here's the thing, though, you guys. From where I'm standing, I book maybe three or four non-union commercials a year. To me, you are a super success. <laughs> and I say that in the kindest way. So this panel to you... Oh, that made me feel so bad for you. <laughs> and, and I don't... And, Oh, I can't say it any other way. I feel like, oh, oh no. It's like looking at a dog at the pound. Oh, my man. Thank you, though, but I'm sorry. For, I realize when you listen to a podcast at home, you usually Google the guests and look them up. So we'll do some introductions here. Brandon, if you don't know, Brandon's been a recurring role on Grandfathered. He was on The Mick. That was on... a show from a, several years ago. <laughs> a John Samos uh, 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 piece. He's been on yeah. You're the Worst, Parks yeah. and Recreation. He's, he's self-sabotaging, but he's a great friend. Yes. And he's Very a nice. talented actor. And let's introduce each of our guests here. Yeah, yeah. On the far end, give it up for director Payman Benz, everybody. <laughs> Hailing out of Silicon Valley, Payman has worked on shows like... Uh, the Last Man on Earth, Brooklyn Nine Nine, Black Monday. He's done a lot of great work. Uh, in yes. the middle, we have Lindsey Craft. Everyone, please yeah. put your hands together for Lindsey Craft. <laughs> Lindsey has been in the business for 15 years. She's been on so many great shows. I'm going to read them because I have a terrible memory. Ooh, no Happy Endings, Newsroom, Getting On, which was your first major recurring, or were you a series regular on no, that? Not a series. I'm going to say you're Talking to the microphone, yeah, Lindsay. Not, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, Dirty John, Veep, The Connors, and now you heavily recur on Grace and Frankie, or are you a series regular? I'm not a series I'm gonna regular. Say, I'm going to say you are. This but from is where me. Brandon's standing, you're yeah, kicking ass right yeah, now. Yeah, there you go. So this is just a chain of who you're envious of as you go yeah, down that's the line. What this, that's the beauty yeah. of this lineup. Uh, but you're uh, also the writer, EP, and star of Upcoming Pretty, which is in the work at CBS. Dead. It's dead. <laughs> it did yeah. not... It did not get picked up. See, that's, not that's the beauty of this time. podcast right there, is Dude. the fact that you can have uh, something right there in front of you that's yeah. it's just a gone. cash cow, and then Brandon brings it up at the yeah, worst yeah. time. I'm, I'm here to bring up all terror. Anybody have any living grandparents? Do you, <laughs> you want me to bring up anything else horrible in your life? Uh, I have well, one, let's but I haven't talked to them in a while. Oh, God damn. God damn. Uh, one more time for Lindsey Craft. Thank you. <laughs> and our final guest is the great... Writer Demi Adigiwebe, everybody. Give it up for Demi. Demi has written on shows like The Late Late Show with James Corden and The Good Place. He also did the, um, he was also a performer in his own right. He did the Gilmore Guys podcast, which was a huge success and a lot of people loved him from that. Give it up for Demi, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. So I've now also they... done a show that died. You... Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And it's, uh, that's great. Yeah. And it sounds like Payman just recently worked on a show that died. We were talking about backstage as well. Yeah. I, I was a producing director of a show for Comedy Central that you're never going to see. <laughs> Look, we've all got things that you'll never, ever see. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's so funny because... Let me, let's talk about that. Let's, let's first question for the panel here. Me and Brandon, as far as I know, Brandon, you've never... Talking to your microphone. Everybody talking to your microphone. I feel like you have never made a show that had an opportunity to die. Neither have I. What is, what is that like? I mean, I feel like, as I alluded to, you have something there, and payment lasts because, yeah, it's got to hurt, but I feel like you, had, you were in the arena, as they say. That, what's that no fear quote? 
If you if you're in the arena, you have a chance. If you're not in the arena, you don't have a chance. I don't know. I you miss one hundred. Are you quoting? Shots you don't take. What say so what? You miss one hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Sure, you're thinking of? sure, that's it. But okay. I no, I think it's something about being in the arena. You have a chance if you're not in the arena. Are you quoting like no fear T-shirts? Yes. <laughs> don't act like that's a normal thing. That is a normal thing. No, it's not a normal yes, thing. I wear no fear T-shirts and I wear Massimo from Target. <laughs> That's all my word. I feel like this is now an intervention. Anyway, get back to your question. So I, all I'm saying is you guys got the opportunity to do that and then to have that taken away. What is, is there, I don't know the, the process with that. I can't even fathom that at this point. Is, is it something where you, you are so excited that you even had the chance to do it? For me, there's a part of it that is that. We're like, oh, thank God that we got as far as we did and it was so nice to do it. But then there's also this sort of like, the first time it happens, there's this brood that is cast over everything you do where you're just like, this one might also not, uh, might not work. Where you're just like, until it's on TV, I'm just like, uh, I, this one, what's the point in getting excited about any of this? Right, it gets you a little yeah. jaded. Yeah. I, I think I might be like the most unjaded person that I know. I mean, oh. I'm, I'm so grateful that I got to like get paid to write a script for a, for CBS and I mean, I'm sad that it, I'm just sad that it's not going. It was um, um, Santina Muha. Do you guys know her? Oh yeah, she's, she's an amazing performer here, and we created it together. It was about um, her moving from New Jersey to LA to be like the next Oprah, and it was called Pretty. And it was like we were so excited about it, and I think it's a really great show that it will just n not happen at least n now. But I was still so thrilled to have the experience and and learn i learned so so much but yeah it sucks to for it to not go but yeah. still happy like absolutely that's what i'm trying like yeah so silver grateful. lining weirdly. yeah yeah like for me i've gone through both of those the, i did a i directed a pilot in 2010 for mtv which we should have known and uh <laughs> and then uh we felt really good about it and we delivered it and then uh they showed it to the president of the network and then they said that he stood up in his chair and said they redefined the sitcom. And we were like, we got a show, baby. And we were like literally planning the most expensive sushi dinner. And then we did it. Oh. We're like, oh, we'll do this tomorrow, right? We'll do this tomorrow. His name is Tony DeSanto. The next morning, we get to the office on deadline. Tony DeSanto announces he's leaving MTV. Oh. And we were like, so what? They love our show. And our producer's like, uh-uh. Like, new person never takes the old person's thing. And that happened on the next pilot I did. And then I was like, oh, nothing will air. And then this one, I knew making a show with Comedy Central was a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, Why is it? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't be as specific as you'd like. But when you <laughs> say that, what do you mean you knew it was a bad idea? From past experiences? Just watching the network oh, for the last okay. decade. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. yeah, knowing yeah. we were making a very different show than anything mm -hmm. they were making. They did champion it. Like the, the executives there were into the show, but we knew in the end they didn't know how to market it, and that's what it came down to. But I'm more bummed that like we had actors on the show that gave like such great performances that like it was a Rory Scovel show and Bo Bridges and Mary Holland and Sashiro Zamata. It's like an unbelievable cast, and it felt like a uh, an FX show, and I think that's what threw them off. Um, and you filmed eight episodes of it this. We past did summer. eight episodes. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, yeah, in in uh, Atlanta in the summer, super fun. <laughs> uh, and uh, wait, we, I, I hate to do. Yeah. I, I hate to. I'm going to bring up money a lot here tonight because this is about maintaining success. Let's just be honest. Feel free not to answer these questions. I, Brandon told me not to ask anything about money, but I don't really like Brandon, so I'm going to ask him anyways. <laughs> Did you get? Would you have gotten paid more if it aired? I'm not as familiar with the DGA rules as the uh, SAG rules. Not the first airing, but every other okay. time it airs, I would every I episode would have you directed. Some. Yeah. Okay. And then a little something because I did the pilot, because um, you get a little kickback if what you direct the pilot. With, so all these shows did not go. Who owns them now? Yeah, that's an interesting. So the show I worked on was a show for Marvel called New Warriors, and we wrote a full season. We wrote 10 episodes and shot a pilot, oh, and uh, Disney was like, this is incredible. It's one of our favorite things we've ever seen, and it was supposed to go on Freeform. Did they stand up on a chair? They, yeah. They stood up on a chair and said, Walt Disney is dead, and this is the new <laughs> god. Uh, 
oh, and then the All next right. day uh, he disappeared. I don't know. Uh, it feels like when you he said when you said he said he read you guys redefined the sitcom. He was like, I don't like this. You changed what a sitcom is, and I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they really loved it, and then they showed it to the network that was supposed to buy it and going, oh, I don't know if this is what we wanted. And so uh, they dropped it, and Disney was like, oh my, it's guys, we're Disney. We'll fucking figure out a place for this. We'll put it on Disney+. Plus." This was 2017. We're like, uh, the platform's coming out in two years. They're like, yeah. And we're like, well, that show's never airing. Uh, then the whole merger thing happened, and we have truly not heard a word about it since. Uh, so Disney owns it, but everyone's contract contract is like long expired, so it's just out in the ether, and it's like not technically canceled, but okay. yeah. Microphone voice. Yep. Is this something you guys fight for though? When it's not, like Rob, you were part of the creative team in Robbie, and you on on your show weren't you? You were a writer as well. Yeah. Is this something you guys want to fight for, or do I you mean, try to, or is your lawyer just like it's not worth the time? Well, I came in late. They developed it without me. Okay. I came in to direct the pilot. And then after I did the pilot, they were like, I went on as a producer. Then I was part of the team. So they're shopping it. At, like, they just tell me, and I'm like, just let me know if we have more episodes to shoot. Like, sure. I have no, I have, there's, I, I have no, nothing. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing I can do at this point. <laughs> I have zero power. <laughs> yeah. Except protest Comedy Central out front. There. Yeah, just, yeah. You heard it here first. It's true. Hey, they're going to come back as a streaming network yeah. <laughs> called, like, Comedy Zubu Max. or something. <laughs> yeah. Zubu? Oh, I'm a huge fan of Zubu. They're Zubu, great. it's on your phone, and it's one minute long. <laughs> I, I, the thing that I learned from doing this was, like, from the very start, if you have like a feeling in your gut about working with certain people, like just really trust your gut on that. And I, I knew it was sort of a, not a great idea from the start, but I kept saying, no, this is a great opportunity. This is, it's gonna be good, it's gonna be good. But just, I, I've learned to, to find, I found my voice during this process because I'd be on a phone with, there'd be you know 10 people on this conference call and I'd be like, these are the characters I came up with in my mind and, thinking, and everyone's talking about it and I'm like, I I'm the one that knows the answer to this, and I wouldn't say if the you know if the network executive would say, we feel like this character is not likable enough, and I would just kind of just not I would just be like silent on the phone, and my supervisor would speak on my behalf, and I was thinking, why am I not speaking up? Like wh- Lindsay, come on! Like and so by the end of it, by the final round of notes, I finally started to to speak up, but I find that being like a newer writer is just really difficult to like take ownership yeah yeah you don't want to step on anyone's toes you don't want to offend anyone i feel that way even with my podcast just reaching out to industry professionals i'm like oh they're busy they don't want to hear from me they'll they'll banish me from this town if i reach out so i, I how much no. lower do you intend to go hey it's <laughs> a great point <laughs> but you gotta start from the bottom and then you go here yeah is that, is that on a no fear shirt <laughs> yes, it is. Cool, what, cool, what, cool what you're saying it makes i mean you're we we work for so long to get these opportunities that there's this fear of like, I don't want to rock the boat. Yeah. I don't want to get, you know, I still am like afraid to call my agent. I'm like, I don't want to bother him. And then I'm like, I don't know why I'm like making him money. That brings up an interesting point. Cause this was on my, my question list and I was hoping there was a different answer, but it sounds like there wasn't in your guys's career. Has there ever been a power shift with your representation where suddenly you didn't want to bother them? And suddenly they, it seemed like, Oh, I'm in control now. They're calling me rather than me reaching out to them. I just want to say I have been dropped by six agents. Jeez. Yeah. And so, and I was, I, the, when I first moved here, I was dropped by innovative artists and I had just tested on a pilot and yeah. I was like, oh, I'm in, like, I'm like in that world of like testing and they, and they just called me and I was in such a, such a state of shock. And I was like, I have nothing. I have nothing. And it yeah. just made me just made me just dig deeper and work harder. And just I I'm like all about just not about so much about the business, but just like getting better as an actor. And I, that's what I sort of dove into. And every time that happened, I would just be like, I'm just going to get so fucking good that no one, like I'm just going to be unstoppable instead of like kind of wallowing in the, yeah. you know, because it's just suck. Like every, and I feel like I've just been, now I'm like proud of being dropped. I mean, six times is a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of times, you know, and I can't even get six meetings. So yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, what's wrong with me? Like, why, why does this keep happening? You know, why is this happening? Yeah. So I, you, I you haven't even experienced a power shift, even w- with your recurring on Grace and Frankie at this point. Oh no. Now I feel like I, now you're in control. No, I mean, I feel like <laughs> now I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> People walk all over me all the time. I don't think that's ever going to end. But I'm, I, 
I feel like now I know what I'm talking about, and so I can get on, get into a conversation and be smart about what I'm saying, as opposed to being like, "Wait, what did they say? Like, did you get feedback?" Now it's not. I'm like, I'm not. When they call me and they're like, "We're gonna call and get feedback for you," I'm like, and I don't want feedback. I'm not interested in, in how they thought I did. I know how I did, and if they don't, you know, if, uh, I was saying my. The three worst words that you could say to me is not moving forward. Fuck you. <laughs> you're not moving forward. You go, girl. You not, you're not moving forward. Don't. It's not moving forward. Like, on to the next. I'll, I decide when on to the next is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't like this, these terms at agencies. I love this. this is <laughs> I great. do, too. This is cool. I, I like living vicariously through it. But you haven't experienced that payment? No, I, I did. I mean, it, I got my agent really early. Really early. And... Uh, I knew it was early and I was so afraid to call. Yeah. So I just acted like I didn't have one. I just pretended I didn't have an agent and just worked extra hard and was like, one day it'll be worth it. One day, because they can't just convince someone to hire you to be like, oh, trust us, this guy will be worth it one day. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, I'll just keep working and grinding and show them my voice. And then eventually they can make the calls and then it went and then slowly I started calling them a little more and then once I started booking single camera stuff now they call me first That's great. which is like different but there was never like they were always cool I was just terrified of them for right. a, a very long time so yeah. I think about um, how yeah. I used to like <laughs> when I lived in New York and I started and I was with innovative artists in New York I feel like I'm really ragging on innovative artists but <laughs> I was so poor. I had uh, no money. And I was just like, I have to get them Christmas gifts. I have to get them Christmas. And I'd be like going to, I'd be like walking through Chelsea Market in Manhattan, like just looking for like, I don't know, donuts or whatever it was. It was like cookies. And I was just like, and it was impossible to like not spend a lot of money, even on small things, because you want to give them to all the agents. And I'm just remembering thinking like, and now I don't get gifts for anyone. I'm just like, why was I doing that? Like, because you want them to. I was like gonna you. say, you get gifts for your agents. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so. I felt terrible until that last part. <laughs> Great. No, okay. I don't do it. But I just, it, I, I was so desperate, you know, just like to make them yeah. like, oh, you have to pop in and say hey, like. Well, you want to feel noticed. Yeah. And when you don't hear from them for a long time, especially on the acting <sighs> side, you're you're just like, are do they are they submitting me? Are they not submit? Do they even know I'm here? What's happening? It's a weird. Then you, you're with UTA, correct? I am. When did you sign with them? Uh, oh, God. Uh, I want to say I was, like, uh, this was, oh, God, I have a terrible memory, and I'm also now drunk. Five years ago. <laughs> Five years ago? Yeah. Did you notice a shift in your career? I have never once in any scenario felt like I'm in power. <laughs> uh <laughs> Is this like in with an agent or just not even right your, now? Your no, no, no. In my life, uh -huh. uh, in all of this discussion, I'm just kind of like power shit. No, what? to this day, I'm still just like I, I will just be like, God, I wish I had a job. Like, who can I call? And it's like, oh, I guess I have people that you do that for me. But I'm like, I don't want to bother them. And it's like I, there's no scenario in my life where I feel like I'm, I've worked hard enough to just be on like to make the move to do something and even now when I ask friends for advice they're just like you should reach out for this I'm like but then I'm bothering them and yeah. it's like you're asking them to like do a podcast or something but I don't want to bother them and it's just like it's a very hard thing to uh, like fight that urge and I've never really figured out how to do it and it's like my managers are lovely I uh, because of uh, the WGA bargaining thing going on right now don't talk to my agents although I didn't talk to them much before either uh, but like it, it, there's just it's never like I always feel this sense of like I want to be doing this more than anything in the world and I don't want to rock the boat and I don't know what I'm doing and I remember when I signed with my agency I didn't realize that I was kind of working with another agency at the time so there was a time where I was just like oh cool and I was just like should I tell them about this? Uh, no, I don't want to. It's going to be a weird thing. And then, like, they at one point were like, wait, are you working with this other team? I was like, oh, yeah, should I told you that? I was like, yeah, you kind of have to. And I was just, like, so afraid that I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, like, for, like, a solid year, I would just not tell them when I was doing things. Just be like, uh, what, what should I alert you to the fact that I'm doing? <laughs> what do I not? Like, what is this? Do I need to sign something? Do, I, do you work for me? Do I work for? Like, it's just so many things where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm terrified to ask questions. <laughs> To this day, uh, if, if, if I could open this up to anyone uh, off of that, like what percentage of your work that you get now would you say is from your representation, and what percent? And just a guess of is you just going out there and 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 finding the work yourself? Jeez, 
I mean... <laughs> There's a math component to this podcast <laughs> when I co-host. I, Pop quiz. Again, I love my reps. I think they are <laughs> wonderful. I truly would not do this <laughs> without them. I like mine too. However... I love mine. Of the writing gigs I've gotten, it's been 100% 100% yours. <laughs> Great. Really? Which is like stressful because there are times where I'm just like, oh, I'm not, I have nothing. I don't have any prospects. I'm like, what do I do? The, the reason I'm asking a lot of, the, I think there is a belief among a lot of people of like, if I could only get this, yeah. if I could only get these reps, then all of a sudden my career will change. It, and it's I, not that. I think yeah, breaking no. down that, belief, that, that myth is important for people who are putting all their effort into that when there are other aspects of this from people who are represented by great people who still are getting their own work. Yeah. It's such a, I, you know, it, it's so different for everyone. Like everyone's journey into getting an agent, getting work is so different. It's so hard to like say this is what you do. All I like to tell people is like, I just like to know kind of what's going on. If I meet someone who I think is talented, I just kind of want to know like what they've done so far to try to get like an agent or work or whatever because it, it really is so fucking hard and I feel like nobody helped me when I first started and I had I, I just like was pounding the pavement my acting teacher is like I, I cannot believe that you're still doing this like because you have you're just <laughs> like no she's like I know she's like most people it's not people, something you want to hear from your acting teacher <laughs> she's like most people like like if they haven't made it give up by the time like you've been doing it for long enough and I'm like that's crazy I, I feel like to me that was never an option and I think um, when it started to shift for me in terms of like feeling like I had to call my agents or think that they had to do everything for me was when I started writing, which was probably like eight years ago. And I started writing plays, which is something I would highly recommend doing. Writing one act plays, I think, is the best possible thing for you to do because people love to read those as um, when you're submitting something for a sample because they're short and you can get a lot done in a one act play and you can put them up somewhere and not a sketch, but like a really something that there's characters and it's interesting and people like to see theater in LA. They just do. Um, and I started doing all of these, I started writing plays and I was like, I'm kind of like, I really like this. And then I started to feel like more in control of my career. I felt like the auditions would come, but I'd be like, I'm going to go home and finish this play and then, you know, put them up. And then I started doing that more. And that's how I kind of became a writer. But that's, I think, what I had to say. <laughs> I feel the need to defend my reps real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Legitimately, just I, in the sense that it's like what they are concerned about is literally just like being like, all right, now how do we sell the stuff that you want to make yourself and not putting me in a writer's room? So when I get writer's room jobs, it's mostly people who are like, oh, I know this. Like the, the, yeah. the shitty thing is whenever people are like, how did you get your start in a writer's room? Like the truth is like, I knew someone who was already in a writer's yeah. room. That's how it happens a lot of the time. We, we get it. You hate your reps. But wait, but, back, but to no. the, back to the math question. I, you, I, no fear. You guys got to <laughs> You guys got to answer the math question. I'm just curious. How much work have you guys generated on your own I, versus how much? I mean, I would say at this point, like 80% is is, is my own or, or, or yeah. I can... You know, if a show comes to me, I can kind of connect the dots to how that came about. Oh, I did that show, then that producer went to this, or that writer vouched for me. They probably about twenty percent of what I do comes from my reps. They, I mean, they send stuff, but I just end up working with my friends a lot of times. Yeah. But um, no, it's it ends up being your you end up doing most of it. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, like as an actor, I would say, I mean, it's fifty fifty. I, I mean, they get the auditions, but a lot of them, it's like auditions I know about for, through a friend who's calling me in. It's so hard to say, but I would say 50-50. To circle back to something you said. Of, uh, Love my reps. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that your acting teacher would be like, I, wh how have you done this? Most people who haven't made it. Yeah. Wouldn't, that it, it's, it's odd to hear from a perspective where most people would be like, obviously you've made it. But well, it's I also... Can, I mean, I, 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 I would... I had real beginner's luck in New York. I started and I kind of booked like the first couple of things I went out for. And then there was like a long stretch of time where I could not book a job. I And I could never book a commercial. I would go out for a million commercials in New York. And when I first moved here, I started going out for them. And I'm like, I'm not going to go out for them anymore because I just couldn't, I couldn't, um, like I couldn't get on a Herald team, you know? Mm -hmm. um, just, I've been, I, while I was on, <laughs> A show at CBS, I was a lead on a CBS multicam um, last year, 
And I was still trying to get on the Herald team because I just wanted to be on a team so badly. And I could not. And I auditioned five years in a row and never got on. Well, I think that goes back to the idea that getting a big rep is key. I think people, when they're starting out in this industry, set these little milestones for them. Get a rep. Get on a Herald team. Get this. Get this. And they, they're they not keys at all. And everybody's No. No. They're not. I mean, I love this place. And I wish that I could be able to be a performer We get it. Here. You hate UCB. You can, no, know. I love it. So, and I just, yeah, I just wanted to improvise and be here and perform here. And I was like, that's a, a, such a cool thing. But it does not equal a career right. in this business. Right. When was the last, how long has it been since you guys have had non-industry jobs? And if it's last week, like me and Brandon, that's totally fine. It was We'd two days you- <laughs> ago for me. It was bartending <laughs> two nights We'd ago. We'd love to have you it. guys down here with us. Uh, like, cheese. Uh, what was that? F- uh, right before I moved here, so about fifteen years ago. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I my first job in LA was uh, being the office manager of an animation studio. But before that, uh, I guess it would be before I moved to LA, which is twenty thirteen. So seven years. Seven years. <laughs> is that how time? Yeah. Math. I'm just here for yeah. that. Dude, you're just good at math. Look at all you. you're good. Like He's your brain. wearing glasses. Yeah, 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 it's glasses. I would say like 12 years ago, I worked at um, Yoga Works, and I opened the studio every morning at like 5 a.m. So do you, That's great. So do you guys <laughs> each you. have... <laughs> do you guys you so each much. have like a... I'm sub- I, sorry, money talk. Do you... Writing-wise, do you have a number of gigs you got to hit in a year to survive? Acting-wise, you have a number of guest stars. Directing-wise, you have a number of uh, episodes you got to. Is there? Do you guys have a formula to that? Do you do you guys pour a bunch into a savings and just live off that for time in the slow times? Or I am currently living off my savings, and I'm very lucky enough that between like just little things I do here and there, and the fact that I'm like an unwed young single man who lives very cheaply hey. in LA. It's like, <laughs> uh, and that's the end of what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm a single, you know, handsome, really talented, uh, tall, kind of... No. <laughs> Living off my savings. Yeah, very rich, very uh, big dick... Uh... <laughs> Are you checking Why your watch you to see your dick size? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, my dick is 1132 <laughs> inches long. That's a new Apple watch and measures your dick size. Uh, no, but the, the fact that it's like I don't have a lot of expenditures means I can, like, work one WGA job a year and be pretty set. Especially, like, I, I worked on a late night show where it's just, like, week after week you're getting paid. That's, and it's like, that's good money. And it's like... For everyone to get an understanding, and again, I don't want you to put you in an uncomfortable situation, please. what would one WGA job a year equal? Oh, I will gladly... Uh, before taxes, I hate saying this. Before taxes, because so WGA scale is about forty two hundred dollars a week for a staff writer before any like agency or tax cuts or whatever. So for tax a cuts. good year, yeah, tax cuts. A good year of that writing is maybe three hundred thousand dollars. You said maybe. Yes. <laughs> like. You you the maybe implies to me like barely three hundred. No no no. When I, when I say that, it's like uh, you have to factor in like the amount of times where it's like oh they're not shooting these two weeks. Yeah, you also or have like, to work that entire year. I see. Yeah. yeah, and it's like then also you have uh, again like I have uh, agents, managers, and a lawyer. That's a cut away, and then tax held and whatnot. And you so pay it's the not, agents you don't like. Huh? You pay the agents that you don't. Don't like? you dare. <laughs> Lindsay, is there a number? Is there do you do you I, I set it up like that in your brain of like I need to book this much? Um, well, I assume nobody does. This is just my formulaic way of looking know, at I'm it. I'm just trying I, to yes and your <laughs> dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't well, call it out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, there's uh, more between me and Mike. I find that um, it's gotten much more difficult to be kind of like a working actor. As that, like when yeah. I first started, um, I could book like three guest stars a year and be kind of okay because. I mean, I was, that's like just kind of making health insurance and that's, it's hard to book a guest star. Like, especially when you're first, I'm like, oh my God, I would, I still jump up and down whenever, <laughs> whenever I book a role, I still get as excited as I did when I first booked something, but, that's beautiful. um, you're the optimist, know, that's she's the optimist, I, know, the like, I love it. Um, <laughs> but like they used to pay well and used to get residuals and I you know I've done a couple I'm, sorry, of- I'm just gonna just so I can uh, just so we can have the same the mirror yeah, yeah well, numbers numbers oh, specifically number. okay so to the so scent. um um I think for a guest star on a drama for a network show is about um 
seven thousand dollars for the for the, the week the week and sometimes it's like 10 days for, like that's a or no it's an eight day eight shoot day, yeah. yeah um and for a comedy on a network show i think it's five thousand something like that i, I it's 5200 maybe i forget but the residuals used to be so good for like I mean, I, I lived off like a Law & Order Special Victims Unit for like a, like a year. That's I mean, my I, first credit is Law & Order Special Victims Unit. Oh and they say like crime doesn't too. pay. <laughs> <laughs> my dick is so big. Uh, um, but I don't know. Like those residuals just don't happen anymore. It's just different. It's all streaming now. Yeah. It's streaming like Netflix. I've never gotten a residual for Grace and Frankie. You've never gotten a residual for oh, Grace They're just starting to come okay. out. But like pennies, honestly, like. It's so crazy, and, and you know I'm a guest star, and I've been on over 20 episodes, and it's really like it is not much money. Uh, but honestly, you get a like, free subscription to Netflix? No, I pay for that really? shit. Yeah, is that crazy? That's, That's your surprising. That's That's shocking. To me. That is shocking. I feel like they give that in like gifting suites. <laughs> yeah. They just give you like a. That's you crazy. can type in password one two three with any email and get a free <laughs> subscription. And they, you know. <laughs> They say Netflix doesn't pay for guest stars, so it's the it's the production company or the studio that's paying for oh, the guest stars, and they say they don't have any money, and so that's why on so many shows on Netflix you find that people are written out of the show, and they just don't even care because Netflix shows only stay on; they don't make money past having a show on for three years. That's what I've just learned. That's why Grace and Frankie is not going to be on after the eighth season or something. I hope I'm allowed to say that. But I think, I think it's been a mess. No, but it's like, it's the most popular show on Netflix, yet they're not making money on it, apparently. That's crazy talk. Yeah. And like Jane and Lily want to keep, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin, they want to keep going. Like they want to keep doing the show. I did not know that. And it's like, no, they're just ending it. Wow. How about you, Damon? What, what's your number? Uh, <laughs> well, for me personally, like I feel like... Um, Every job is maybe the last one because I, I go through this fear where I'm like, "Am I a diversity hire?" Um, uh, every t- you can laugh, it's okay. I said it. Um, I feel and, the same way. Yeah, uh, I didn't say it. It's okay. No, there's so many times where I'm like, they probably felt so good when they hired me, or when I walked in, they're like, "Oh, great, we got one." Um, and uh, but they, I mean, DGA, the rates are good. I've heard the residuals the same we used to be like amazing. Like they're still okay, but. I heard they used to be magical, but for DGA, if you if you direct a network, because I've only done single camera half hour, I don't, I have no idea what hour long people make. If you do an episode, it starts for the week of prep and the week of shoot. It's like thirty three thousand for Holy two weeks. Shit. It's a lot. And then for basic cable, I think it's like nineteen thousand. For uh, two weeks is a typical structure of that's the amount of time they're hiring. For a half hour it, show, you, you prep, prep you prep for four days and you shoot for five days. Well, with the edit is not part of it. The edit is part. It's all part of it. It's all part of it. It's okay. all part of it. And then yeah. you get you you're allowed two days to edit. Okay. Um, and then uh, and then you get nothing the first time it airs, and then you start to get residuals every time after that. But for me, as long I just have to stay busy or I lose my mind. That's basically what it is. Can I just say that like, as we talk about this, I keep thinking about the fact that it's like, we talk about these projects we've worked on where they pay us, and then they're just like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, the amount of money that is being put into these productions is unconscionable for them to then just go like, Scrap. no. Well, it's you. crazy. It's insane. Just, just the amount of money they spend on the food and all the yes. things on set. You're like, there's a lot of money being blown. I and love food. The travel and everything they mm-hmm. put That's people what this up. Is about. Yeah. It's also so Should we talk about crafty? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's talk about Dude. it. Dude. That's my production company's name. Someday. She's crafty. My last name's Craft. <laughs> Everyone's like, where's so crafty? I'm like, right here. <laughs> so, um, you just stand by the table. You do like, that at every show. <laughs> I do. I say it every time. Um, but what's so crazy is that when I was writing this thing for CBS and I'm getting all of these notes, like, Every every week, I, I had the weight of the world on my shoulders getting these notes, and I was like, okay. And I just go back in there and write these notes. And then all of a sudden, there's a no. Like They're like, we're not making it. I'm like, what were all those notes for? For who? For what? What? Like, no, why? Like, now there's this show that exists like in a script form that's for nobody. It is shocking, because that it must tell you how much money they, they have yeah. that they're willing to shoot eight episodes of a show, and they're like, we're not going to do anything with that. That That's is... Insane. It's weird. And it's a, it's, it's tough a, to conceive. Yeah. 
It's a it's a good show. It's <laughs> it's also we'll good. The actors, were, the actors were so good in it. It's such a bummer. And it's it's their way of going. We know that we spent this much money on it, but we don't think that airing it will make us any. Or like they'll be like, well, the marketing of it will just not weigh out the cost that we've already spent. And I'm like, it's just insane. Which is odd because be. from from my end, where I make most of my money as a commercial actor, that if they can't even say. And there's not nearly the money I used to make as a commercial actor. Right. So the, if they have this product and they can't even recoup it from adver- from putting the show out there, uh, it's not because commercials are suddenly costing so much. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I, 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 who is getting all of this money? What is ha- where <laughs> Guys, where's the money? <laughs> no, the first movie I did, like the first big movie I did was with Uma Thurman and Colin Firth. And I was like, I have arrived. I, I was like, it was like Sam Shepard, which is like, Jesus. Uh, Jesus, um, Oh, it was like all these famous. I was like the only not famous person in the movie. And I went, uh, they flew me to New York. I shot this movie. I, I could not believe my life, honestly. And then it was the Yari Group was this company. And the Yari Group went bankrupt and the movie never came out. And that was it. It was like, and then I just, I was like back at ground zero. I had nothing. And the worst part about that too is you guys put, even in all these other shows, you put in all this work and like, I hate to think about people back home, but like you're, you're working, but people back home don't get to see any fruits of your labor. And you're like, mom, I'm doing stuff. I promise you. Amount of jokes that I've written for this show where I'm just like, this is one of the funniest things I've ever written. And I can't show it to anyone because I'm like, well, here's episode seven. Out of context, the joke doesn't work. I'm just like, (laughs) no one will ever know that I did it. It pisses me off so much. Yeah. Demi, can I ask you a, a selfish question real quick? Absolutely. We talked about making your own work and how that's important, generating stuff, because our agents aren't doing anything for us collectively. Obviously. Except mine. Mine are great. They're working really hard, and I appreciate them. Tim yes, at Activity LA, he's fantastic. Uh, you did a very popular podcast, Gilmore Guys, for yes. a while. Did you, as somebody who's hosted 300 episodes of podcasts, I don't know if you've heard, mm-hmm. I have made... <laughs> Thank you, saying I've made like a hundred dollars on those three hundred episodes. Ah, but you had a very successful podcast. Did, were you able to sustain yourself for a bit off of that podcast? You, I imagine you had to have yes. made a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a point at which the money that I made from Gilmore Guys was more than I was making as a writer. What? Uh, which uh, is not a thing that happens with many podcasts. And I remember seeing one of the like deposits and going, "This seems wrong." And that, what what is it from? From the advertising? Yeah, the advertising. Okay. Who, yeah. who deposits it? Uh, the the network. <laughs> what network? Our our podcast network. Oh, you were on a network. Yeah, we were on a network that was uh, dealing with the ads for us and whatnot. But it's like podcasting is such a weird thing because it is like unless you are close to the top, you it's like you're making fucking peanuts, and it, yeah. it's such a weird thing because you have to work the same amount no matter what. Uh, but yeah, there was a time where it was like my uh, source of income. And it, it always feels weird to just go like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore when that is the case. Because it's just like, it, it's not like artistic integrity or anything, but it's just kind of going like, how much do you want to uh, have your source of income be a thing that you are like going to have to sort of go like, oh, I guess I'm doing this right now uh, any, any time that it, it is the case. Is that more, sorry, the, the way you say that, is that more you don't like performing or was it just the context of the podcast? It, I think it was. I knew you, the, were, you were the not Gilmore Guys fan on it and that was kind of the gimmick. But. Yeah. I, well, I think for me in particular with Gilmore Guys, the, the premise of the podcast, by the way, was uh, my friend was a big Gilmore Girls super fan. I had not seen any episodes. We went through every episode. Uh, by the end of it, though, I was like, I like, I like this show. Uh, I don't like it as much as I feel like I need to to be at the head of this, like, podcast and like have all this attention Empire drawn towards me all this money. Uh, in terms of what Gilmore Girls is and then at a certain point it was like kept going on we were like well we're done with the show we're gonna go on to another show and then it was like oh we're just gonna keep doing shows in this vein and I was like I like this I just feel like it's a lot of pressure and I don't really want to be putting as much energy towards like I was always just like I'm a writer and a comedian and everything else that I do is just sort of periphery and I, I felt like my identity was quickly becoming like I'm the Gilmore guys guy and I was like I I can't do this or else I'll just be stuck uh, being the person who's discussing someone else's creation instead of just making my own so I was just like I think I'm gonna stop uh, at which point like every so often I pick up something else that people are like you're the this guy I'm like 
fuck and I just stopped doing that too uh, but I it, what a problem to have uh, that people like the things I'm doing um, but yeah I, I, I do find that funny sorry I, I would love to be a, known for a thing you know I, I, mean? I would love to be the dad bod guy or whatever you can you can, can I do, do it you can uh, the host of the show the dad bod guy dad bod guy give it up for the dad Ooh. bod guy I refuse to applaud this <laughs> You don't have to. I'll put it in in post. Do you guys worry about that ever being pigeonholed into a thing? Like I don't know, single cam comedies. Are you? Wor- do you no. want to branch out from that, or do you? No, you no. I mean, no. I, 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 I mean, Black Monday was definitely a, a step in a different direction sure, yeah, yeah. because I, you know, um, I've been lucky enough to to work regularly for a few years, and I don't, my, you know, I'm like you. I'm single guy, big, big dick, and all the things that you said now. <laughs> Handsome, very wealthy. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Me too. Conjunctive. Uh, no, like I don't. I don't like. I don't. I just. I'm sa- I don't do, buy, buy stuff except I go to uh, Clipper games and um, best team in LA and. Uh, uh, Yes. Oh, sorry, I forgot the question. I got. I, so I started thinking <laughs> about, about basketball. Getting pigeonholed. Yeah. No, I did. I definitely did because at one point I was like, well, I don't want to just do half hour single camera. I want to do. Can, can I ask why visual. not? Yeah, I don't get what's wrong with being pigeonholed. I I get bored really quickly because I used to make my own stuff all the time, and then I used to write and direct, and then when I started coming to the UCB and I started meeting like UCB performers that were giving me scripts, I was like, yo, these people are way funnier than. Any anything I've ever written, their stuff's better. I just stop writing, and but there's still like a part of me that I really love the creative process. You could really phone it in as an episodic director if you've worked on a TV show. You've seen these directors come in. They usually have Tommy Bahama shirts and and, ma- and make thirty three thousand dollars. They show up, yeah, and they don't have Ooh. shot lists. And all. I hear these stories about these old timers that are getting phased out very slow uh, slowly. Um, They're dying. Yeah, it's just that I want a challenge because I feel really guilty a lot of times that I get to do what I do. So like, I want to earn it. So I don't want to do an easy show. I want to do a show where um, I'm like borderline panic attack on my way to to work. I like need that. I need that fire. Yeah, I found in this industry you got to go towards the fear. If something yeah. scares you, you got to do it because then you'll grow. Really sounds like you're just pitching no fear shirts. Oh, this God. whole thing is <laughs> just a sponsorship. Please, no fear. Pleasure. Come back. 30% pain. <laughs> well, uh, can no we, fear. I, I can do the same question for you. Do you feel like at a point in your career, like, I am just this kind of person and um, I don't want to be seen as this woman? I don't think I've... I, I've been lucky enough to do, like, kind of equal amounts drama and comedy, um, which I think is kind of rare so I, th- I do feel really l- because I started in drama and then I moved here and like one person I remember I got feedback once I went on a <laughs> one of the first pilot comedies I went on out on my agent sent me the email the feedback was not funny not our lead girl and I was like oh, okay guess I'm not S- funny sorry I really- they sent this to you she's my they the she forwarded me the email that was from casting why what yeah, is the I don't purpose know. And then they fired <laughs> But I was like, That's oh, I guess I'm not funny. Was one of the six. Is that how you took for it? For two years, I was like, oh. I'll... And and then it wasn't until like my um, my partner at the time was like, I think you're funny. And I was like, no, I don't think I... I'm like, they told me I wasn't funny. <laughs> oh. And then and then I then I realized, oh, I can, I can, I'm funny. <laughs> Did you take it that well? Because the way you're describing it is like, oh, I guess I'm not funny. I take but, rejection really well. And I think I just have tough skin. I, I, she's been fired by her agent six times. She's, I mean, and she's killing it. I was like a, a, a model when I was like 15 years old, but like a struggling model. Like I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like me with like, you know, I was, when you're from, New York, you don't like kind of get into acting. You get into modeling if you're like tall, you know, as opposed or like theatrical in a way, as opposed to like here that you'd get into like commercials and stuff. And so I started kind of doing like, like, you know, like, uh, <laughs> sounds so stupid. Like, you know, uh, you know, deal use like catalog, uh, 17 magazine, Print. like Abercrombie stuff. And it was an amazing experience, but there was so much rejection. It was, I mean, it basically was rejected every day. Go on appointments, rejection, rejection, rejection. And so I built like tough skin, which I think was really helpful for this. But business. much like you celebrate every booking, do yeah. those rejections still not hurt? Or like, do they? No, like- they, I, I mean, now I've gone to the point where I'm never like, I'm ne- I've never been competitive, like with other actresses, which I think is pretty rare. And I just think it's bad to do that. So I, I, I it doesn't make me feel good, but I understand like, sometimes I just like really, really want a role. 
But I feel like now I'm to the point where I'm never like surprised at how I do in a room. I've like now I know how to do the work and I go in and it's like they either like what I'm bringing and I feel good about what I'm bringing. And if they don't like it, then bye. You know, uh, yes, of course, if it's like when I get close to something like there have been a couple of things that I've gotten really close to that uh, that at the time were devastating that I didn't get because I'm just like, oh, that would have just been like, oh, if I just got that. But then you realize like. You, there, you create space for something else. And I feel like when I first, sort of when I first moved here, so many of my friends, like, I mean, at the time when, like, when we sort of were all going out for things, like some friends who I started with are all famous now. I mean, it was like one of those things where I watched every single one of my friends become like a lead of a movie, a television show, and I'm just like kind of, kind of sat back and I was like, oh, I guess that's not going to happen for me. And so that's kind of, I think, when I started writing, which for me changed everything and felt like, oh, now I have something to offer when I go into these rooms that I don't think, I mean, someone else is offering something else, but if they want, you know, the Lindsay Craft special, they'll, they'll hire me. And if not, then that's okay. Uh, before we go, I want to <laughs> end on this question. Um, I know Brandon here has dreamed about just leaving this town and living off the land in South Dakota or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, going like to Living off the yeah. corn or whatever. How have, Raise your hand. Have you thought about quitting the business? Or don't raise your hand. Nobody's thought about quitting? Never. I've never thought about Demi's half raised. No, but I do have a thing where it's like, I will one day be done with this and then I'm going to go teach math in the middle of the country to 8th graders. Oh, that is beautiful. not a joke. That is the exact My, my wife is an 8th grade math teacher. Oh, this is not a joke. So wow. if you want to talk to her yeah, about I'll how fucking her. horrible that is. <laughs> okay, 7th right grade down. it is. <laughs> Go on. Sorry. I don't want to shit on your dream. No, it's just I. <laughs> your big dick. Dream. You know what it is. Well, let's not bring the big dick stuff into this. <laughs> yeah. Part. Whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> it is just this idea. That's that it's a, we like, have another podcast after. We'll uh, come on. <laughs> Two guys, big dicks. <laughs> Go on. We should start a show called Big Dicks. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm always just like I. There's so much stuff I love doing in comedy, and then I'm like, I I want to write and direct. That is the dream. That is the thing I want to do. And when I'm one day just kind of like, well, I've done all my ideas, or like, well, I I've fucked over every relationship I have this down or something, I'll just be like, you know what I also love is math. And I think I'm kind of charismatic and I want to make some kids be like, oh, I hate math. And I pop in, I'm like, here's a song about math. And they're like, all right, we like math now, Mr. A. <laughs> that sounds so... I, the only thing I dream about doing, which is still in the business, is I, I, just, I really just want to be like a playwright and go. And right now I'm writing my own musical for me to like a one-woman musical... Um, and that's like a new, so I keep finding like new things and that's what I think is exciting like when I found improv I was like oh my god this is and I was just like in improv class all day long for <laughs> I don't know what else I did with my life it was a ridiculous time but I think it's really fun to realize that you can do all sorts of things like you don't you don't have to just do one thing that's what I feel like everyone like seems to think that they have to pigeonhole themselves and like yeah. I think it's so important like no one is going to tell you. No one's going to tell you to do what you are. Like, you have to, like, and no one's going to really help you. You have to just fucking do it. Right, yeah. I know that sounds so stupid and cheesy, but, but like. do you enjoy all those things, or are you doing them because you feel like they're necessary? No, because I enjoy them. You enjoy them. That's Yeah, wonderful. and I enjoy creating, and I feel like, um, I, th like, there's no point in doing this business if, like, you're not enjoying the fuck out of it, because mm -hmm. there's too many other people who enjoy it, and you're just, they're just going to surpass you yeah our jobs are dumb like what we're doing is stupid Very like when i great. i think about like we'll be like <laughs> debating like a dick joke and i'm like what are we doing like there's people doing real work <laughs> out there so i one thing early on that i that you know when i came out here i told my parents it'll take me 10 years to find a career out here and it took about nine years to get into tv but my I came out here wanting to write and direct, but knowing that everybody wanted to. So I was like, well, as long as I'm working in comedy, I'm fine. Maybe I'll be an editor. Maybe I'll find my way into being a producer or being an executive and, you know, make epi eight episodes of a show and then not pick it up. <laughs> uh, I, I knew I was going to work in comedy. I didn't know what it was going to be, but there was no giving up. I also have no other skills. So there was nothing else <laughs> I could have done. Uh, but I learned early on, like what you piggyback on what you said. I came out here and I felt competitive and it started to get in my head. And then once I let go of that and realized like, if I don't get a thing, 
well, how happy is that person who just got it? Their parents just got off their back for three months. I don't want people to be depressed when I get stuff. And then everything changed. And then all of a sudden I was positive and realized that success in this industry specifically is not linear. It never is. It's in most industries. It's like you can connect the dots to somebody getting successful here. You could be struggling for 20 years and then all of a sudden you're like, the lead of a show yeah. or you could be blowing up and then all of a sudden you're like, no one's ever seen you. And it's like, what happened to them now? Like, so I think it was just all about, like you said, like you got to just stay creative and keep making your own stuff. And like, and like work on yourself. I know yeah. it sounds super like, you know, whatever that love <laughs> is, but like, it's, <laughs> like it's so important. Thank God I, this is a visual medium. I, <laughs> I was just yes, doing no, a weird thing with my hands. <laughs> But it's so important because if like you're your creative your your creative vessel, right? So like work on yourself and be a healthy person and just keep evolving and discovering things about yourself because that will make you a better artist. I think for so long I was sort of just kind of like looking to other people in my life to think that like oh they're doing such great things and it's sort of like watching from the sidelines and being like oh that's so cool that they're doing that like oh, like I wish I could do that but like you can go do it. Go like if like you're thinking about doing stand up, go do it. Like go to an open mic. I I don't know. This is this was my struggle. Like I never thought I'm like I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I can't do it. Like yes, you fucking can. Like it's in you. You know if you're here, you're an artist. Like just go for it. I'm no, smiling like a great. weird smile. No, right now. that's no, great. It's I think great. I, 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 yeah. I, I am. Uh, I think it's lovely the the amount of positivity or or perspective rather that the three of you have in different ways of how you the success you've achieved and yet how you view that success or how you view your role in this business is for me, and this is hard to say, a really lovely thing. Oh, Brandon. Wow. And his Aww. heart was eight sizes bigger that day. Oh, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, sorry to rain in the parade. When it gets really dark, though, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's say you don't, you don't book a job for nine months. Okay. What's, what's pushing you through that? Payment's point. I mean, I'll like, tell you exactly. This is what I learned early on is that uh, I would, because, you know, things are so up and down here. I learned very quickly that the highs are really high here where you're like, oh, my God, I've made it. I've arrived. And the lows are really low. And then you start to realize that it, it's a pattern. Mm -hmm. It starts to go up and down. And for me, the trick has been, I don't know if this works for anybody else. For me, it's when things are down, I know that it's going to come back around. That it, it'll just keep rotating. It'll come around, and then when I'm until up, it doesn't, I don't get well. <laughs> but then when I'm up, I don't get too ahead of myself because it can go back down again. Because there's a lot of people that want to do it, but there is work. It's just like you just gotta outwork people. I mean, that's really what it what it comes. Yeah, down I remember to. like um, I because it, it's hard now to think about because I d had these feelings but now it's kind of I've had an, I've been doing it for long enough we where, get it you're successful no I'm not I mean I barely think I am but I yeah no I understand that I am and I'm grateful for that but <laughs> there was a time where I wasn't you that know was really honest don't laugh at her very, no that was, that was a very nice moment that was very beautiful and I I, I, I I was agentless I had just been dropped by an agent and I remember which number the, which, yeah, which, yeah. Number? <laughs> which one was it how big at that time was Demi's dick uh, <laughs> do you think it's been growing in you said it was 11 <laughs> 32. So How do you think dicks too. work? <laughs> I have no idea. That's the point of this podcast. Everyone slow down. It's going to go no. down to zero in a few minutes. <laughs> but I remember I had heard about this audition for this show called Southland that was on NBC. It was like this cop show. Yeah. You remember the show? Okay. I remember Southland. And ben McKenzie. Yeah. Yeah, the star of OC. I made, I, I, I made out with him in the show. I made out with him. Ooh, that's hot. Oh, that's oh. hot. Oh, boy. Um, you made out with Brian Atwood. Let's watch a clip. <laughs> and I made out with Adam Brody in another thing, too. So I was like, what? I'm really making my way around the OC, Also a great baby. podcast. A number of people you made out with. A number of um, hot dudes you made out um, with. But I, I didn't have an agent. I had heard about this audition for a girl that they wanted to date, McKen uh, date Ben McKenzie, who like was a singer... Like a, a, it just sounded like me. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't play guitar, but I ended up. Anyways, I, I begged my manager to call and try to get me in. At the time, I had a manager who was just like, he would just be like a bulldog about stuff and go after stuff. And the casting director did not want to bring me in. I heard him. He had me on the other phone, on the other line, like listening. <laughs> I've had some what? weird I What know, is I know. going on? Why are they letting you see the other <laughs> side of the strange. curtain? This know. is crazy. They're You're like, very strange. Your reps are the, the people from Mean Girls. Yes. <laughs> no, this was like, these are old wow. reps. I like my reps too. <laughs> um, so 
I ultimately, I got the audition. I was like the last person to go in and I like did the audition. I like sang my heart out. I just remember, I remember going to Jones on third with a friend and I ordered a pear because that was all I could afford. Uh, I was like, while she was eating this lunch, I was like, I'll have a pear. Wait, I'm more concerned that Jones on third sells just a pear. <laughs> Also, I feel like they would charge like $5 yeah. for a pair there. <laughs> they probably did. But anyways, I got the part. And it was like, and they asked me if I played guitar. And I said, yes, I do. I had never picked up a guitar in my life. And the next week I had, I had, I had five lessons in four days. And I learned how to play guitar oh for, for this thing. Come on. We have to that. That's hustle, man. I mean, That's cool. I mean, I had... I, I don't think it's that great. I mean, anyone would do it if they got the opportunity, right? I don't think that's true. No, no, no. But no I'd like run away. Most, it yeah. was the most glorious feeling in the whole world. I was like, I was at the lowest of the low. Like I had zero. I just remember I had like no money in my bank account, and I booked this job, and I just thought, oh, wow, wow. Like, okay, there, there's something. I, I, I this is, this is possible, you know. Yeah. And then there's always been like the downs and the ups and. The downs and the ups. Who says that? It's the ups you and the do. downs, right? You do. No, no. Roller coaster operators. <laughs> 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 Demi, same. You've. You, how do you get through those lows? I would love to know. I. Oh. <laughs> no, I feel like it's funny that you. Where when are you, you now? Can I ask now? Like, in, in oh, I think I'm in a low. You're in a low. Great. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. Great. I feel like my career hit a plateau so early. My first writing job was on The Good Place, a show that I worked on for a season and then was essentially fired, but really just not rehired for the second season. And then from there, it's been like I worked on another show that I liked that didn't get picked up. And I worked on Late Night and left that show because I was like, this isn't for me and I don't really enjoy it and I'm not doing anything here. And now I'm in this like plateau, uh, current nine-month plateau. So when you said nine month, I was like, interesting amount of time. <laughs> uh, where it's just been like, like I, I wrote I mean a, to trigger you. I'm sorry. No, I know. Uh, it was like I wrote a movie and then I'm like trying to develop some stuff but it's a lot of things where I'm just like it's up to me to make my own motivation and just kind of do things and I'm like ah, this is hard for me and I would love to get back in a room at where that isn't the case and it's like I go on meetings where I'm like this show is absolutely not what I want to be doing but I just want a schedule again and it just feels like I, I'm just sort of like waiting for the thing where it's like I can think of myself as a writer again. And it's like at the same time that I'm doing all these other things that people are like, I like this thing of you and I like this thing of you. It's like, I enjoy doing these things, but then I start start feeling like people see me as like, like a content creator. Like, you're the guy from the internet. And I'm like, it's not a bad thing to be that, but I feel like I've worked so hard to hit this like mark of like, you're a writer and you like you can be taken seriously because you write writing credits and whatnot. And then when it's like, I'm not really doing those things anymore, I start to be like, well, then what do I do and what was I just lucky was I a diversity hire like am I ever going to be good enough to do that again do I really have this if I can't motivate myself to do it will I ever get there again it's all these things where I'm just like oh god how do I get out of this funk and it's like sometimes I feel like the only way I will get out of the funk is like someone just being like yeah, do you want a job and I'm like well I, I hate that the idea that like my entire mood is up to someone just being like yeah do you want it because I also have been on the other side of this and I know that like Jobs are just come from the craziest things. I've had meetings with people where they'll tell me like, yeah, I was just like, oh, we need another writer. And they're like, someone name a person. And they're like, oh, what about this one? And they got the job. And it's like, it's so, it may, there's no sense to how anything works in this town. And I hate that like, we've chosen to work in an industry where all of our moods are just at any point connected to like the whims of people who are just lazy and just want to not read a bunch of packets, but just go like, someone tell me the name of a writer and I'll hire them. And I just feel like, uh, it's just about sort of trying to figure out how else to motivate myself and even just to feel good about what I'm doing. And I feel like very recently, one of the things that helped me out was I was uh, just like, I had so much free time that someone asked me, like, we're going to do this shoot for a bunch of things in Utah. Would you like to do that? And so I went out there and just getting to work with people and getting to make things and feel like I had this creative spark that was like, at someone else's behest where it was like I didn't have to be like the sole motivator to get people to be creative and get myself to be creative maybe just be like I like doing this and I remember why I like doing this and I was just sitting at a computer being like I want to write forever I want to direct shit forever I love comedy I love being funny I, this is what I want to do and it's that sort of spark that you get from not having to be the sole person motivating yourself to do work that makes you feel like oh, that's why I do this. That's why I still want to do this. I don't hate myself. I don't hate doing this. I just hate having to be the person to push myself to do it. But it's like, I feel like whenever I feel down and out about how I look at myself or how I feel about even just doing this business, it's all about just like 
figuring out a way to do the things that I love again without having it be just up to me to do it. Like working with people and working with people that I don't necessarily know and growing my network and being like, oh fuck, if I wanted to make a thing here, now I know a DP that can do this for me. Or like, oh, I know a producer that I love to work with again. Here I know a sound guy. Just like expanding your network and starting to feel like it's not insane and scary to uh, make anything you want to make anymore now that you have all these connections and just sort of like being afraid of failing and being afraid of making a thing that you're like, this might be shitty. You're saying no fear? No, no, I'm saying some fear. <laughs> well, those am, were great shirts. I would 100% wear a, a some, some fear. I would totally wear and that. And on the oh back, my God. in the back in so small fun. fonts, just like snakes, spiders, murderers, clowns, <laughs> John Wayne Casey, uh, Draculas. Um, Dra- but, multiple Draculas. <laughs> there are plenty. Terrified. Um, but it's just about like finding what it is that makes you stop feeling like you stop feeling like you're worthless or stop feeling like you can't create when it's just like you can you just have to be you have to stop fearing yeah I guess it's no fear you have to have no fear about certain aspects of this whether it's like letting other people determine your worth or thinking that you can't make something because it's just you doing it it's just yeah it's a hard thing but you just start making stuff and being and finishing stuff and finishing yeah you gotta finish some things Uh, but uh, even just starting the process sometimes is enough to make you feel good and it's like as much as we all are like ah it sucks that these things didn't get made it's like we probably felt great while we were working on them yeah it's all about the process Yeah, it really is because it's like we're you know We'll it's partially about the process, but it's also being able to make money from other things. Yes, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. To engage in the process. It is, it is important to make a living. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really, it, it is, and I, you know, it, it, it's, it's fucking hard. It's hard. Like, and it's hard to get a break, and I, I, I think that it's really important, like, once you do get in that position where you can help people, is fucking help people. Because... That is the only because the reason why other people are getting stuff is because people are helping them. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. you're it, you're wearing a shirt right now from Harris Whittles. I sure am. And I remember uh, uh, an expression, and I don't. It's probably not his, but he said, "Send the elevator down." I don't know, which uh, was a yeah. great expression of yeah. if you're if you have achieved a level of success, send the elevator down and let people come up to your level. And I think that's a great way to live in this business is to realize it's really hard to get to where you are, and if you can't help, help. I, and people are always like, "Oh, she because she knew someone." Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's uh, yeah, and because and because I know someone, she's gonna get that audition for the thing that I think she's right for, and I'm gonna I hope that she gets a job, and I'm gonna put in a good word for her. Yeah. So, and that's how everyone else is getting a job. Exactly. I daydream of like one day show running my own show and being like, "Fuck, I know the funniest. I know the funniest people in the world. I know the person who would be great for this room. I know the person who'd be great for this thing and this thing and this thing." And it's like just getting to the place where you can like give these people those opportunities seems like such a joy that it's just like. Come on. That is the dream. Yeah. Like I, I like directing, but now what I'm trying to do is I want to sell a show so I can like direct one episode and then just hire my friends and new directors yeah. to, to come on. Because people help, you know, when I, people help me, you know, when I was first getting into directing, giving me tips and stuff. And um, yeah, that's the, that's the ultimate dream. It'd be the best. Yeah, Thanks. this is great. This is a great thing to end it yeah. on. I think that was yeah. honest and true and I feel the same way, and I look forward to helping all you guys when I make it. I know that this is, <laughs> I know that this is how you're ending it. Can I end it on one more thing? Oh yes, please. I, I like my Asians. I love <laughs> them so much. I, oh, I got yeah. it. <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you so much for thank g- you so coming much. out. Give it up for our guests one more time. Payman Benz, Lindsey Kraft, Demi Adigiwebe, Brandon Sornberger, BoxAngels.com. Have a great night, Let Mr. Dadbot. <laughs>